Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to start this afternoon's program. Uh, I'm Ned Lodwick, Vice President of Grand Homestead Association, and I'll welcome you, or probably the first of the several welcomes you'll get, and uh, would like to introduce at the start of our program this afternoon, uh, singing a selection of our, of our own. Deanne Kelly Croft has been a supporter of our association for years. I won't say too many years because you're too young to have it in too many years. Too many years. Uh, but it, it's real hard for us to come up with the music program for this. I have to call Deanne and say, Ed's going to be in town on so and so a day. Pick the songs and get your music and come and do it all. And so that's what Deanne does for us. So we'll let Deanne take over to her, do her part of the program. As I always enjoy the program, the more songs she has, the better. <laughs> Thank you, Tommy. I think, uh, uh, oh, there, there we go. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, especially for someone as esteemed as yourself. So I try to, uh, each year, have kind of a mix of music, north, south, uh, war songs, regular songs. Uh, if uh, you don't hear the song that you wanted to hear today, I'm sorry. I, we have to sit here a lot longer, and, and let's face it, we want to get around to hearing uh, Ed talk. So, um, uh, I'm going to start off my first selection of something that just was popular in the area, which is Call Me Pet Names.
main name of Paul. Uh, the according to some research by the Great Potato Famine and the uh, Great um, Emigration from Ireland caused there to actually be a great deal of Irish folk on both sides of the Civil War. And uh, some of them took back some of the tactics that they learned during the Civil War to uh, help them fight against uh, Britain. Uh, so in honor of St. Patrick's Day and uh, the Irish in the Civil War, I'm gonna sing the song that was um, inspired by when Johnny comes marching home and has the same melody um, that you'll certainly recognize. <laughs> With guns and drums and drums and guns, hooroo, hooroo. With guns and drums and drums and guns, hooroo, hooroo. With guns and drums and drums and guns, they are in an air as Darling John, it's been so long, oh Johnny, hallelujah. Tis glad I am to see a home, hooroo, hooroo. Tis glad. Yeah. 
All right, let's get a little happier here and think about prison. <laughs> Somebody. 
Somebody's pride, who will tell his mother where her boy died? Somebody's got me, somebody's pride, who will tell his mother where her boy
forgive me, it is not a civil war. Okay, it's a civil war song. Um, but it is God Bless America, and I think that that's something we can all uh, enjoy. Thank you. <clears throat> While the storm clouds gather far across the sea, let us swear allegiance to a land that's free. Let us all
church. We thank Pastor Dan and the members of the church for allowing us to use this facility. Uh, this is my church as well, and uh, I will not break into song. <laughs> well, a little bit of housekeeping here, as if those of you who have been here before, that's usually my task. The emergency exits are, of course, in the back the way you came up. There's also a stairway to the first floor through this door here. There's also an elevator back that way. The restrooms are downstairs, uh, back this hall, uh, in the connection between this building and the fellowship hall. I uh, want to call your attention to our annual grant celebration on April 24th through the 27th. Uh, General Grant will be participating as well as a number of uh, presenters on the life of Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, we have a series of raffle items, the uh, pistol, a quilt, and uh, our Brown County commemorative rifle. So those are all available here today. We have merchandise for sale, as many of you have already taken part of, uh, including some books written by our speaker today. Uh, oh, DVDs. I saw this, it looked like duds. And I think, <laughs> think well, what duds meant? It's DVDs. <laughs> You can appreciate my writing. <laughs> uh, we also have uh, <coughs> membership applications, which Mike will be very will take uh, for. Cell phone. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Uh, I'll join you if you would uh, turn your cell phones off. Now, uh, I want to introduce uh, our resident General Grant, Dr. Kirk Fields from Memphis, Tennessee. You want to say a few words there, General? Brevity is beauty. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to uh, say it's good to be back, and I come as often as I can. Today, I have someone with me. Carl, you stand. This is my aide de camp. Colonel Orlando Moore of Michigan. And yeah. And Colonel Moore and I are old friends in every sense of the word, and he saw fit to join us today. He came to hear Ed and to serve as my aide de camp. As I am today serving aide de camp to the great Ed Boss, you always have a boss. <laughs> And we're glad to be here, and I wanted you to meet Colonel Orlando Moore, for he is here to honor Ed and yourselves. No no, you, you have no words. I have no words. <laughs> <laughs> I, actually, I would like to tell you that I am from Southern Ohio, Minusburg, actually, and uh, it was uh, a great treat to drive my motor home down here yesterday. Uh, we got to our campground. And uh, there was a tree down. Oh, oh. So cold. Yeah, about, uh, about 38. So thanks. <laughs> the, the typical Ohio March welcome. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Now, I think you gentlemen are the usher in up this way, please.
Thank you.
the only Brown County boy to be important at the Battle of Spotsylvania. Several local boys had joined the reformed 60th Ohio, came from about 10 different counties. In April of 1864, so they didn't form until very, very late, John Ellis of Company D, the 60th Ohio, from, from Chris's 2nd Brigade of Wilcox's Division of Burnside's 9th Corps, wrote about an event. He said, we all remember the morning of the 9th of May, how we were formed to march with our regiment in extreme advance. We had shown such good staying qualities on our march from Catlett Station to the wilderness that they were not afraid but we would be able to keep out of the way of the veterans behind us. On that march that morning, General Wilcox and staff were ahead and ran into the enemy's pickets. And of course, they came back in a hurry. General Wilcox came riding up to our regiment and asked Colonel McElroy how the Ohio boys were in the advance. The Colonel answered and said, you need have no fear about the Ohio boys. So we maintained the position we held. However, we were assured that there was only a small number of Johnnies left as rear guards, and we would soon do them up. Two companies were selected as skirmishers, and they deployed and crossed the Nye River on Mary's Bridge and advanced up the hill. It was not long before their advance was interfered with by an overwhelming number. They fell back to the main line, and as the 60th was some distance in advance of all the other regiments, they received the full shock of the advancing rebels. I was close to General Wilcox's side when that took place, and the enemy came out of the woods in front and on both flanks and opened up on us, and then the dust really flew. After they had been engaged for some time, General Wilcox said, the fools, meaning the 60th, don't know when they're whipped. He then ordered one of his staff officers to go to the, to go at once and order up other regiments to their relief. During that fight, which did not last long, we lost and killed or wounded more than half of those engaged. The Battle of Mary's Bridge on the Nye River was often overshadowed in history books. For as everyone knows, two days later, the men of the 60th took part in a great, in a far greater fight at the Spotsylvania Courthouse. Uh, they were on the far left of the Union lines. Uh, one of the DVDs in the back is about Ed. And we don't have the DVD there to sell, but we have information on where you can buy it. So with my introduction, you'll see why you probably want to buy it to get that on, on DVD. Ed was born in Billings, Montana, the elder son of Omar and Virginia Bars. He grew up on a rugged family cattle ranch, the E Bar S, near Sarpy, Montana. His father, a World War I Marine, read accounts of military campaigns to young Ed and his brother. Ed's interest in military history was jump-started by a biography of the dashing J.E.B. Stewart that he read for school. Ed named many of the ranching animals after famous generals and battles. His favorite milk cow was Antietam. Ed graduated from Hardin High School in May of 1941 and hitchhiked around the United States, visiting his first Civil War battlefields. He enlisted in the Marine Corps on April 28, 1942, and by July was on the troop transport to the Pacific War. He was with the 3rd Marine Raider Battalion in the invasion of Guadalcanal and the Russell Islands. The seventh, then later in the 7th Regiment, 1st Marine Division in New Britain. January 2nd, 1944, Ed was severely wounded at Suicide Creek, Cape Gloucester, New Britain, by Japanese machine gun fire. He spent 26 months recovering from in various hospitals. 
is use that experience as a tool to teach future generations the value of service and sacrifice. He was honorably discharged from the Marine Corps as a corporal on March 15, 1946, and returned home to Montana. He then used the GI Bill to finance his education at Georgetown University, from which he obtained a Bachelor's of Science degree in Foreign Service Studies in 1949. He then received his Master's in History from Indiana University in 1955, writing his thesis on Confederate General Patrick Claiborne. As part of his research, he visited Western theater battles, battlefields on which Claiborne fought, telling friends, you cannot describe a battlefield unless you have walked it. On the battlefield of Shiloh in 1954, he made a career decision inspired by a park historian he met, Charles E. Pete Shield. Interpreting battles on the field is far more important than the academic study of history in an office. He soon took work as a historian at the Vicksburg National Military Park. At Vicksburg, Ed did the research, leading him and two friends into the long lost search for the Union gunboat USS Cairo. And the book they wrote is back on that table if you're interested. They raised it from its muddy tomb in the Yazoo River and placed it on display at the Vicksburg Park. It's considered one of the best uh, displays at the military parks in the United States. He also located several other forts and enlisted the development of a variety of new parks and led in efforts of hundreds of historic sites around the country. This morning he told us of the of the setting up the LBJ Ranch as a national park site and uh, gave us the story at lunch today. It was quite interesting. In 1966, Ed was transferred to Washington, D.C. and on November 1981 was named Chief Historian of the National Park Service, a position he held until 1994. From 1994, to 1995, he served as a special assistant to the director, and after his retirement in 1995, he received the title Chief Historian Emeritus, which he holds to this day. Retirement was loosely defined in his world. Uh, he travels and leads tours uh, to approximately 200 a year. Uh, we're very lucky to get him here. We scheduled this usually back in September, to try to get on the book. Uh, last July, he had the honor of throwing out the first pitch for the first annual Armed Services softball game that was part of the Major League Baseball All-Star Game in Washington, D.C., and was uh, honored to by the uh, National uh, Baseball League to bring he and his family to the game. So they got to see the game. And he told me last night that was really great because he had been at the first All-Star game. <laughs> Seats weren't as good. <laughs> Kaminsky Park. He saw Babe Ruth run around the bases after he hit the home run, but he couldn't see him hit the ball with the seats. <laughs> so there's history right there. So it is now my great honor to once again be able to introduce the man who is the voice of the American Civil War, Ed Barnes. So they 
uh, called it, they verified it with the insurance actuary. I was probably, I'm, according to the insurance actuary, I was the only person who saw that, uh, saw the first all-star game on this planet. <laughs> I did not have a good seat, I will tell you that. The one seat I had was because my uh, grandfather knew the most important man in baseball. Who at that time is the most important man in baseball? Kazel Mount Lattice. He's the uh, last uh, commissioner that had gonads. <laughs> <laughs> Management doesn't want a uh, uh, commissioner like Judge Landis, of course. So, uh, so I uh, was there on tickets that uh, my grandfather got from Judge Landis. At that time, the commissioner's office was not in the same uh, move to various places in Chicago. He did not have a commissioner's office in New York City or any of those places. So uh, that was quite an experience. Now I'm going to call your attention to the map uh, of uh, May 10th. Now this is at the end of the Battle of Spotsylvania. I hate to say Grant was not successful at Spotsylvania in crushing the Confederate Army. Now, President Lincoln, as the, uh, as 18, President Lincoln knows that in 1863, he's going to have to face the voters uh, because he's going to have to run for re-election. And the war is still on. And uh, his congressman is Elihu Washburn. Always good to see no congressman. <laughs> Elihu Washburn was from Maine and the Speaker of the House. And they passed a bill resurrecting the rank of General in Chief of the Army. No one has held that position since George Washington. And they copied the language of the Washington promotion. And, New and, Washington, and U.S. Grant is going to be named General in Chief of the Army. That means he's going to be a four-star general. Uh, and, uh, and, of course, his mission is to make sure that Lincoln doesn't lose the election that year. In, in other words, Grant makes the decision as General in Chief of the Army He's going to command, he's going to stay in the East, and I hate to be General Meade. How would you like to have the General Chief of the Army overlooking your right shoulder? And, uh, and uh, if you, and your mission is to uh, put your army deep in Virginia and break up the Army of Northern Virginia and make sure that Lincoln will not have to stand for re-election in the fall of, eight, of 18 uh, of that year. That, and of course, the election is always in the, second, the third week of November. So you can see this meeting taking place here, takes place just after Brad has been appointed Commander-in-Chief. And just after the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse. And they're sitting under this oak tree, which still stands at Mazapani's Church. And there they are. Now, the guy that's holding the map on his lap is U.S. Uh, is, is US Grant. Over on the other bench is General Meade. Uh, so, uh, General Meade is commander of the Army of the Potomac, but Grant is general in chief. Meade has a big problem right off, General Burnside. Because Burnside 
great stress. And uh, Burnside ain't very good. Uh, you would uh, not be very happy speaking about General Burnside. And Burnside during the during and up and through the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse, he has to take orders from you. And your staff is getting very urinated off. Because Burnside isn't very good. And uh, generally uh, doesn't do well. And you can see him out here on the map, out in the field. So, and Grant is also responsible for General Sherman. Because General Sherman's orders are to put his army deep into Georgia, break up General, uh, break up uh, the army commanded by Joe Johnson. That would be a hell of a lot easier job than breaking up the army commanded by General Lee. Uh, and uh, they're talking about what they're going to do next. So I've been kind of anticlimactic here because that indicates when they have this meeting, Grant has not yet succeeded in winning the Battle of Spotsylvania, uh, which was a very difficult situation. The battle is going to be fought in what is known as the Wilderness of Spotsylvania. They've got two main roads going to the Wilderness of Spotsylvania, the Orange Turnpike and the Orange Plank Road. The Plank Road would be what you would consider an improved road at that time. And they traverse the wilderness going from west to east. Now, Grant had uh, already tested General Lee in the Battle of the Wilderness. And I believe I spoke here the last time at the Battle of the Wilderness. And, uh, and uh, Grant did not want, the Union did not want the Battle of the Wilderness. And if you want to figure where is the most important that place in America, in that area, to discuss General Grant as the commanding officer. Now, all Union <coughs> generals, including Grant, at the Battle of Wilderness had not been very successful, whether they're General Hooker or uh, a number of others. So uh, Grant, Grant is going to be the latest. And actually, the Battle of the Wilderness is a uh, if you're in the Yankee army, you're going to lose about, General Grant is going to lose about 20,000 men in the wilderness. And they, it's been a very terrible battle. The battle of the wilderness is going to end on the seventh day of, seventh day of, uh, of the month, of the month of, uh, of the, of the month of uh, May. And he's going to make his most important decision right now. Everybody in the Army of the Potomac, everybody in the Army of Northern Virginia believes that Grant will turn back. And you can say the most important place in the wilderness is in the intersection of the Brock Road and the Orange Turnpike. Because when Grant comes there, they do not continue eastward along the Orange Turnpike. They're going to turn in to the Rock Road. Now the Union Army lost almost 20,000 men in the Battle of the Wilderness. And now they're going on. And they will cheer as they head down the Brock Road, which appears on your map, going on the Spotsylvania Courthouse. General Lee is probably the only man in the Army of Northern Virginia that thinks that Grant won't turn back. All his men are, yeah, think he's gonna turn back after all. Four Yankees have been killed, wounded, and captured as a wilderness that have been captured at the Battle of Frederick, at, at the Battle of Chancellorsville. And the 
Union Army is going to head down the Brock Road. The goal is to get the Spotsylvania Courthouse off on the right side of your map uh, and beat General Lee to Spotsylvania Courthouse, which is out of the wilderness and on the main road going north and east uh, to Fredericksburg. But unfortunately for General Grant at the time, Unfortunately for the Union soldiers that are going to become casualties, General Lee is having Longstreet's successor. Now, the guy that takes place for General Longstreet ain't very good uh, because uh, 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 at the time that Longstreet is more as badly wounded. Longstreet, if you were a doctor, you figure a lot is a lot likelier to die than General Thomas Madison Jackson. Hmm. But the Lord decided differently, and uh, and uh, Longstreet will uh, live, but not be very active at this time. If you're active later on. To be active in the closer phases here as the Union Army. And the Union Army cheers when Grant doesn't go back. That proves he's not a Joe Hooker. <laughs> he is, is not a General Burnside. And he's been no, and he is, uh, and he uh, is. He will have General Meade's army under him. Now, Grant will has assessed Meade very well, and uh, he is satisfied with the Army of the Potomac. Uh, and, and if I was Grant, I would be very, very burned off at my good friend, General Sherman. Just as the command begins, General Sherman will write a letter to General Grant. Grant will make the, hat, uh, the mistake of handing it to his one of his staff officers. And it says, I, I have advanced as far as the Etowa River. I don't know what the Italians are going to say. The Etowa River is like the Rubicon in Italy. You don't cross the Rubicon unless you want to challenge the Rubicon, the, the uh, set in there. And he said, we were here, and I hope to hear more things from you, that now that the Army of the Potomac is inspired by you, and that's been read, right in front of General Meade and his staff. Now Meade and his staff, as his staff officer says, Meade wears very thick glasses. I always like to say, these eyes like to pop out of his eyeballs and this portion of his glasses is about as thick as a Coke bottle. And he gets up and he says, pray tell me, why does the army need to be inspired by General Grant? So when General <coughs> Grant leaves Mount Carmel Church, which still stands, from the time he's a boy in this area where he grew up, Grant never liked people to ride out in front of him. And his horse was Jeff Davis big horse. And he gets on Jeff Davis, and Meade is getting on Old Baldy about that time. And uh, this is after the battle of, of, uh, of what we're going to talk about, Spotsylvania. And Lee, and it's obviously that Meade is angry, is grinding his teeth, puts his spurs to Old Baldy, and he passes up General Grant. So 
that's going to show that their relationship is under some strain. So it's going to be very good because we're going to have General Grant with us here today. <laughs> and the Union Army has taken the road that's going to lead them south and east to Spotsylvania Courthouse. On your map, Spotsylvania Courthouse, you can see uh, on your map uh, right here, it's on the left, it's in the left-hand corner. That's Spotsylvania Courthouse, and the Brock Road leads to Spotsylvania Courthouse. Now, Lee knows of another road, and he's told uh, General Anderson, probably the best thing Anderson does in the whole war. He's supposed to open the road, uh, the Catharpin the Road, that is a shorter way to get to Spotsylvania Courthouse. Grant also is going to have other problems. His other problems is dealing with General Sheridan. Sheridan is a, a short fellow, like all short fellows, and he has a very, very high opinion of himself. <laughs> And uh, as the Union Army moves down the Brock Road, that's the uh, Union or the Red, they're moving down the Brock Road and route to Spotsylvania Courthouse, where you can see where it is. In theory, Warren should get there first. But Sheridan's cavalry doesn't do very well. They waste too much time on the way. And they have to bring up General Warren's Fifth Corps. Now, Warren is a hero at Gettysburg. In my opinion, he's probably not the best subordinate in the Army of the Potomac. And uh, he will, uh, uh, he, he's an engineer, and engineers always like everything to be just right. And uh, he's and a staff officer in the Union headquarters has a big problem. Because Warren does something a general shouldn't do. He's going to tell his staff to don't report the losses as heavy as they are. So that indicates you better watch Warren very, very closely. Warren's a good engineer, but he's not a very good subordinate. In fact, he's given some very bad orders at the wilderness uh, to General, uh, General Griffin, and Griffin is not very happy with him. So Sheridan, there's problem with Sheridan there, we'll talk more about that later. And the Union Army moves on. And unfortunately, because of the road that Anderson has opened, that's probably the only good thing Anderson does in the whole war. And the Confederates move where you can see the red arrows along, and they are going to arrive at the road, uh, at, at, at the Brock House Road Bridge, and they're going to get to Spotsylvania first and get up on high ground, a good uh, infantry position. This, they will get there on the morning of the, uh, of the, uh, of the <coughs> eighth. And they will attack the Union, the Union, the Confederate forces up there. Uh, and they will not move the Confederate forces. So I can just see me, I can see both me and Grant uh, probably very unhappy because Warren and, and worse is, Maybe Meade isn't as smart as he should be. Maybe he shouldn't have blamed General Sheridan's cavalry for screwing up and letting the Union get, letting war and Confederates get to Spotsylvania first. But we'll go back to that later on. So they get there and they're going to form up, and you can see that. Uh, 
uh, Warren has arrived there first. You can see uh, the Nye River, and you can see uh, the uh, uh, Laurel Hill, the Yankees, the, Con the Confederates are there first. And they're going to attack and attack. But the Confederates, due to who me thinks is Sheridan's problem, Sheridan didn't obstruct the road from Todd's Tavern on. And that's going to come back to haunt you again. So you, you're, you're, uh, so Grant, Grant has some, some problems. Uh, uh, and uh, the next day uh, is going to be the, uh, uh, this is of course on the, uh, on the 10th. On the 9th, you have the 9th Corps has arrived at the area of Laurel Hill and uh, the latter, the latter, the only, it's kind of hard if you're a Democrat in the Union Army at this time. Because uh, you can get your butt in trouble much faster if you're a Democrat than a Republican. So when they're going to come out there, uh, at the area near where the visitor center is. Uh, there are Confederates on the uh, road, the Brock Road, that goes on on a straight line into uh, Spotsbury Courthouse. And uh, there's a, uh, some sharpshooters over there. And uh, me, uh, uh, me, Grant, and their staffs are smart. They know the Confederate structures up there where the two roads come together. They used to have a park because there used to be a filling station there, which you, you, you were unlucky and never saw that filling station's gas pump. And that's where the Confederate structure is. It opened fire. Then, so, General, uh, so, uh, <coughs> The poor general, Judge Cedric, has just told this poor Union soldier they couldn't get an elephant at that range. <laughs> Bang! And the bullet hits Cedric right here. And right here, that means Cedric is going to go to uh, ne Neverland. He's killed. Maybe he is He's recruiting the last active Democrat in command in the Army of the Potomac. And he has been eliminated here at the, uh, on the ninth day. So uh, we're now moving into the ninth day. Now we have on our staff Emory Upton. Emory Upton is a workaholic. He will be like many workaholics. He will be writing regulations to reform the United States Army. And has been working on it very hard after he's moved to that wonderful place if you're an Army officer out of San Francisco. <laughs> Being a workaholic, many workaholics have a problem. Every Upland committed suicide in 1882. But his big day is going to be the day after Sedgwick is KIA. Upland is, every Upland is going to get 12 records. He knows the Confederates have taken up a position in what is known as the mule shoe. This is a salient angle rust out from the area around where the Cedric was killed with his apex sticking way out there. Then it turns, <coughs> it's called the uh, 
the mule shoe, because it's shaped like a shoe that you shoe a mule with. So you can see up in there on the mat, count one, two, three, three times four is twelve, and he's going to line up. Well, brightness, one right behind the other. This is going to be on the ninth. He's reconnoitered out there. He can see he's moved along a trail. They come out of the woods. And there, 400 yards in front of him, is the west angle of the mule. And he's going to send his men forward. And that North Carolina Brigade of good Confederates aren't as good as they think they are. Because Upland's men break the Union line at that point there temporarily. Capture a number of cannons. And, and uh, you can see the, what, that is the west angle. See the angle there that Upton is going over. And uh, so Brad is now going back to the drawing board. Yes, you meet with me. And he's going to say, uh, I think the Confederate position at the mule shoe is weak because you've got a pointed, you've got the, the angle pointed out toward the Confederate line. That is the angle. The, the angle that is important is the one where you can see up and going through like this to a tin horn on the uh, eight. So now the mean, uh, mean, so Meade and Grant, Grant has to approve it. Meade decides, Grant decides, we're on the uh, 12th, we're going to break the enemy line. Now flip the map. Now we are over to the 12th. All right, you can see the apex. The Confederates, however, <coughs> The whole rules of war have changed. Beginning with the Battle of Shiloh, soldiers are now digging trenches, cutting an abbey, which is the Civil War equivalent of barbed wire. And they're finding out that earthworks with, uh, with, uh, Bell timber out in front is something they didn't teach him at West Point. Why didn't they teach him at West Point? Because the army is not armed with rifled muskets until after the Civil War. <coughs> They're armed both sides with smoothbore muskets. Smoothbore muskets, you're somewhat in danger if you're 50 yards. Uh, Within a hundred yards, but with a but with a but with a rifle weapon, you're in danger at 300 yards. So the area out there is covered with heavy timber out in front, and you have a ravine which you can see a stream passing between the Confederate line and where the Union are forming up. It's a terrible windy, cold night on the night of the 11th and 12th. As the Union troops begin to move up, it seems that some of the soldiers in the, uh, in Hancock's Corps that, that the, the engineers are lost. And they're wandering around in the the, uh, the uh, open ground and running the con 
better than I, where about 400 yards is open ground, which means that you are in big trouble if the Confederates are entrenched, which they are entrenched. Now, in the mule shoe, there are two weak places. One at the apex, that's the point that furthest north, and the other is the west angle. The west angle becomes bloody angle. That means that you've got a good chance of dying if you attack the west angle. That's going to be the bloody angle. So, uh, Antoc is going. And the Confederates are screwed up. He doesn't screw up very often. He is of the opinion that the Union Army is going to pull, is not, is going to pull out and move by roads, taking them north and, and east of Spotsylvania Courthouse. And they are going to pull most of their artillery out of the mule shoe as the rain pours down. Now, if you come out of there where the Union are forming up, there you're going to see uh, these are Hancock's people, three divisions, probably about 20,000 men. You can see they're advanced. They're going to come in. Now, if you walk it, you, you follow a trail, and you go out there, and it drops off rather rapidly. Then it rises as it goes down to that water course and then comes up. And uh, the first thing you can see of Yankees is the head, then the neck, then the chest. That's a good time to start shooting at the Yankees. Now, the worst is they're going to a weak spot in the Union line. Hell, by Stewart's brigade and Allegheny Johnson's division. Allegheny Johnson was a failed ladies' man. <coughs> what is a failed ladies' man? He pursues ladies with expensive gifts, with good flowers, and he isn't really interested in marrying them or anything interesting. So uh, he's a, a ladies' man. Lee knew him quite well uh, from his West Point. And Johnson is burned off when they pull the Confederate ar artillery out of the mule shoe. And the Union are going to attack. Now, when you, when you fortify, you, your, your line of trenches, say that's your line of trenches. Now, about every 10 yards, they have a traverse. What is a traverse? A trench that runs at right angle to the trench line. That means if you see a number of, uh, of these uh, uh, traverses, you're going to be in big trouble. As the Confederates can fall back from traverse, from traverse, to traverse, to traverse, and that's going to give me that uh, time to bring men up. But the Union do score a breakthrough. Now, uh, when they escort General Allegheny Johnson and Marilyn Stewart, they all know each other from West Point. And Allegheny Johnson is very jovial. He is not happy about being captured. He's not happy about his line being broken, but he's not going to refuse a cigar or a drink of whiskey. Marilyn Stewart is uh, a son of a bitch, and the sons of bitches screw themselves badly. And if you're hostile to your captors, that means you're going to walk all the way to Bell Plain, 20 miles away. Whereas Allegheny Johnson gets to go in a wagon all the way and get cigars. So, so if you get captured in the Civil War, I'm not saying if you're captured by the Germans 
or the Russians by knowing about the Civil War. If you're captured uh, in a West Pointer and you're fighting West Pointers, Allegheny Johnson shows that if you uh, uh, are not upset too bad, you're going to get a, a, some, a, some cigars, you're going to have to be able to smoke, you're going to have a few drinks of whiskey on the way, and you don't have to walk. But Marilyn Stewart has to walk all the way uh, to uh, the, uh, where they take the prisoner. So we've broken through temporarily. All right, now we're going to have uh, <coughs> you're going to have Burnside getting involved. Now Burnside, Meade is going to tell Grant. Remember, <coughs> Burnside is your responsibility because Burnside ranks me. So Grant says, I'll take care of Mark Burnside. But by this time, Grant's staff officers are getting journeyed at all. They don't like to, uh, your staff officer, you don't like to guide uh, a person that is not very bright, who's already not done well at Fredericksburg in the position. So then, then you can see Burnside. Now, Grant's a rather patient soul. How long is it, General? You don't get rid of me for another, almost to the end of, uh, of Spotsylvania, do you? So you can see Grant uh, is a generous fellow. Imagine, uh, imagine a few of your staff were probably wondering, why are you letting Burnside us? We don't like being a nursemaid to Burnside. That's that problem with right as you go. And he doesn't really do any game. Now the only place they really break through is the west angle. That's the bloody angle. And the Yankees come in there and there are two more lead to the rear incidents. That one that took place in, uh, in the widow's field is only the first. It took place for the guys that are better at publicizing themselves. Now you gotta remember, Texans are good at publicizing themselves just as they are today. And they protested when uh, Lee is going to lead them into battle. So the two leads of the rear incidents, Alabamans and Mississippians aren't that uh, proud of their selves, and it's going to become a very, very bloody uh, battle. Uh, at the Union have broken the line, the Confederates are counterattacking, and what should have been a major victory uh, for the Union is screwed up uh, by our good friend, General Burnside. All right, so uh, the 12th uh, ends, and meanwhile, Lee now put Lee now pulls his line back. And if you look at map, uh, look at map, look at the uh, Union attack of May 12th. You can see the Union are red, the Confederates are blue, and they're, they're sitting off the uh, ruddy angle. So when the Union attacked here, the Confederates, are, of course, are the, uh, are, uh, are the blue ones now, and they're going to have their artillery in the position at that time. And his attack is there, and Grant is going to decide, I'm going to attack to the west, as you, uh, to the east. That will be the map that says Confederate response on May 12th. And there you can see the Confederates counterattacking on the 12th. Well, the, uh, it has been a very bloody day on the 12th. It's a bloodier day during the evening of the 12th. And uh, Lee uh, and, the, and the, what looked like a success has turned into a stalemate. So uh, Lee will uh, 
then the uh, rat will then move over west, excuse me, east, and try to get and try to capture Spotsylvania Courthouse. As you can see, the Union forces over here at Harris Farm. And now they're going to do some work. Now the casualties are very heavy. The Union have a source of trained soldiers. These are the heavy artillerists. They have been in the Union, they have been in Washington for, for 36 months. And they have not been in any battles. So, between Stanton, Meade, and Grant, it's decided we're going to convert the heavy artillerists in the infantry. And the heavy artillerists are not very good infantrymen. In fact, uh, when we go to the 18th day <coughs> of, uh, of June, they won't even advance when they're told to advance. So uh, the uh, situation is getting rather grim. Now, as they move up to uh, finally, Grant and now Grant and Sheridan are going to have a big to do on the night of the uh, on the night before the battle before Upton's attack. Sheridan is making, uh, Meade is making a big mistake, since I know what's going to happen. <laughs> he is chewing Sheridan's ass. <laughs> Sheridan doesn't like to be chewed out. Fortunately for Sheridan, Grant's headquarters are very close to it. And Meade is saying to Sheridan, you're right to be right, Calvary. Probably much worse than I'm saying. Didn't do well when Warren was marching to Spotsylvania Courthouse. And we had to push the Union cavalry out of the way. Sheridan uh, Brett now hears, now people when they get angry, <coughs> They always make a big mistake. When you get angry, your voice gets louder. And Red hears the argument going on between Meade and Sharon. Meade says to Sharon, why didn't you do what I wanted you to do to brush those Confederates out of the way on the march uh, from uh, March to, uh, to uh, Spotsylvania Courthouse. Well, Sheridan said, well, I wrote you a memo and said, if you just let me be in charge of the cavalry and use them all together, I will go out and I will take care of Mr. Stewart. So, Grant, uh, Grant is, Sheridan, of course, is Grant's favorite general. And uh, whether you like him or not, he's a pretty good general. Basically, until he becomes a cavalryman uh, in the spring of 1864, uh, he was an infantry commander. I always have to tell the guys that pick on Sheridan, he, after all, he's an infantry commander. He's not a cavalry <laughs> commander. And, uh, but, Unfortunately, he wins the argument. And Grant says, take your cavalry, move out toward, uh, toward, uh, move out toward uh, the, uh, uh, the church, as you saw the photograph of the church, move out to that road, turn south of the telegraph road, and boom. And that's what Sheridan does. Sheridan has good luck because on the 11th, his cavalry ends the life of Jeff Stewart. Went back to 
a sergeant uh, in his late forties, C. Stewart. Stewart's sure, easy to recognize as a flat boy in uniform, takes a shot, hits Stewart in the abdominal area. And of course, in the abdominal area, Stewart will uh, be put in an ambulance, taken to his brother's in law's house on Grace Street, and there Stewart will die. But that's not a good day for uh, General Lee when Stewart dies. And uh, 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 he's, he's going to ask the uh, the last request he has is going to be uh, a religious hymn when he dies. He wants a religious hymn uh, and it will be sang to him. His wife will arrive after Stuart is already dead. And now Lee is ready to move on. And he has. Uh, lost about 20,000 men. The Confederates have lost about 12,000 men. Now, uh, the Union can afford to lose large numbers of men. That's one thing the Confederates cannot afford to do. They can't play war and uh, with a force that has unlimited manpower. And, uh, so now, so, so now the uh, Battle of Spotsylvania has ended. The Union has lost, killed and wounded. Uh, out of their force that they started with, with over 130,000 men, have lost around 30,000 men in the campaign. The Confederates have lost about 15,000. The Union can afford the other way. And uh, Grant's about not ready to turn back. Finally, before the battle of the Cold Harbor, evidently, me and Grant are not talking to each other much when they get to Cold Harbor. And they decide to put themselves. Well, uh, we're going to uh, start cooperating and not uh, be each going our own way. And of course, the uh, Grant, uh, Grant and me between them will get the army across the the the, uh, the river, the uh, James River, almost without a loss of a man. Surprises Lee. Don't let the people tell Lee Lee's never Lee doesn't get around Petersburg. Until the eight, until the twentieth, between the eighteenth and the twentieth, before Lee realizes that Grant has gotten well away from him and is in front of Petersburg. And uh, now Grant is going to back off uh, on these frontal attacks against earthworks, and he's going to decide we will go after the railroads, cut the railroads off and keep the Confederates uh, from getting supplies. Also in Georgia, Sherman is doing pretty good. Uh, the Democratic Convention is meeting in Chicago at the Wigwam, the same place the Republican Convention met to nominate Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln also told his campaign manager, don't cut any deal. But he, did, but he did cut a deal with the governor of Pennsylvania, Governor Cameron. A big mistake, they're all going to find out. And, uh, and, uh, they were, and now uh, Grant will begin to go for the Confederate supply lines. By the uh, by the 25th day of uh, 25th day of August, Grant, in essence, has not destroyed the army. And on the 20 on the 20 on that 26th, 
Lincoln writes a letter to the files. And he says, as of this day, I will probably lose the election. McClellan was running on a plank that the war is a failure. Let's sit down and talk it over. And he, uh, and that's what happens. And uh, meanwhile, before the 25th of uh, August, Sherman has captured Atlanta. And it's ours and barely won on the second day, on the, on the second day of, 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 of September. Now, I would also argue that uh, Cedar Creek fought on the 19th day of October. I would argue that it is even more important because Juba Early is apparently willing the Yankees on the 19th. But the, but the, Yankee, but the Yankees, but the Confederates count their victory before it's won. And Sheridan does what he does best. That stubby little bastard <laughs> rallies his men, and the Confederates end up getting whomped in the Battle of the O'Pepin or Bird Winchester. And Lincoln, when the voters go to the polls, he'll win with an overwhelming victory. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure to be here. And Longstreet was probably shot 
and arrange the lesson from what you're saying to that person that's halfway back there. Now he hit, now Longstreet was hit much worse than Jackson was. Longstreet is hit, he has trouble speaking again to the damage of his trachea. Now, he probably should have been hit. Uh, Jackson, of course, uh, was shot in about by his own men, accidental shot, probably at about 40 yards. He was shot, uh, uh, Jackson, when he was shot, was shot in the, uh, uh, the chest and in the palm of the hand. Because they know what type of bullet he was shot with because it was a, it was a, a smoothbore weapon, smoothbore weapon, because it stayed in his glove. And when he pulled the glove off Jackson's hand, off his left hand, off his right hand rather, they, they found that the bullet was found. He probably died of uh, pneumonia. Longstreet, uh, was, Longstreet, if you were a doctor, you'd probably say he's much more likely to die because he was shot. And then he was, the bullet went in behind his left elbow, left shoulder blade and came out right here. So they, yes, they, they have a high rate. And, uh, and Stewart was shot by a guy with a pistol. It went through his pancreas, so he doesn't last very long. So yes, there's, there's a very high percentage of generals. Now at the Battle of Franklin, six Confederate generals were killed in Franklin. Of course, they're very short range at Franklin. So that's, and they, and they lay them on the porch of the McGavick house. Actually, they, they exaggerate. They only lay about three of them on the porch, should say. Disperse it. Other people collect the other the generals to bury where they didn't know what church they want to be. Like Cleveland is very about 15 all, miles off first. Then after the war, they moved Cleveland to Elm Harbor and so on. Yeah, Mr. Barks, I've been accused <laughs> of making a mistake by going through the wilderness instead of around the wilderness. Do you think I made a mistake in going through the wilderness rather than around? I think, uh, I think you made a mistake. You <laughs> didn't <laughs> go into it, but you would have. If Sheridan had done his job, but of course he defends himself by saying, me is giving me my orders. Uh, if, if Sheridan had done his job, and thrown the, the Confederate cavalry uh, back from the tavern where they were staying, they probably would have got, you'd be able to get to the wilderness all right. You talked about uh, Warren being not, not being a very good subordinate. Was there something between Warren and Sherman where Sherman didn't like Warren and tried to get him drummed out of the service? What's the question? Sure. Sheridan? Sure. Was it Sheridan? Sheridan and Warren, were they across, did they not get along? Who's that? Sheridan and Warren. Sheridan and Warren did not get along. <laughs> they got, did not get along. Now Sheridan, at the Battle of Five Forks, Sher Warren does not want to go to Five Forks. And uh, so uh, he had, he goes to five fork, uh, he goes to five forks and uh, and uh, and that, that was not where Sharon wanted to be at five forks. And that's where uh, uh, Sharon, Sharon told Grant when, 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 uh, when uh, they wanted reinforcements, he says, you've got Sheridan, you, you, you've got, you've got Warren. And 
and, uh, and, and we're not going to discuss that. He said, I'm tell Warren, if he doesn't do as you want, you have authority to relieve him. So Sheridan uh, took his authority. And I think it was probably wrong, but that, that, that second, that's money more than quarterbacking. Would you tell us a little bit about how savage the fighting was at the Mule Shoe? How savage was the fighting at the Mule Shoe? The Mule Shoe is uh, probably it was a mistake. I think I think there were uh, me and, and uh, the people who were attacking there knew that. Uh, the Emory had broken through that area the previous day, captured a large number of Confederates when they attacked the West Angle. Now the, now the West Angle is that thing sticking out. So that's, that's the uh, angle there. Put the map in your uh, So the mule shoe is where the uh, Angle is there you can see up and attacking in a successful attack on the uh, on the on the eight. That's Upton. And they figured that was weak, uh, but the Confederates have reinforcements close around and touch. If you look at the uh, little map that says Confederate response, it's interesting to me that they marked the oak tree. Most people have read about Pennsylvania you know that oak tree was nearly cut in half. Yes, so they are. And that's how severe it was at that point. They put that tree on the map. All right, on the, on the, uh, the oak tree was located at the dead angle. That's that angle jutting out on the west angle. And when you see the tree, it's like a beaver has gnawed it. <laughs> so it's 20, it's 20 inches in diameter. And you can see it just, it gets up here, uh, it stands about as tall as I am. And from my belt up, it's getting smaller and smaller, the tree is. The, uh, the people, uh, the, Bar in uh, Spotsylvania was one was unhappy when the Yankees came through and light the oak tree and shipped it to Washington and Stanton put it outside the door of his office. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it looks like it's it looks like it's been gnawed by a beaver. Mm -hmm. Ed, you said last night somebody was talking about the army of whenever they crossed plowed ground thought they should entrench. Can you elaborate on that? Yes. Now, General Thomas. Now, General Thomas is probably, Brad is a rather reasonably, I say, he was a nice guy. But, but when, when Halleck relieves Grant, as command of the Army of Tennessee. That's right after the Battle of Shiloh. He appoints Thomas to command the Army of Tennessee. Now, Thomas had not lobbied for the job. That had been a, job, a decision by Hal. And I think that's one of the reasons Grant does not like General Thomas. Because at, when they're doing the siege of Nashville, Thomas keeps getting uh, the letters going to the paper from historians. Now, I know who Historicus is. It's General Schofield yeah. saying that Thomas will not attack Nashville. He will pass bypass Nashville, and the first thing you know, the Yankees are going to be up in Kentucky, heading for Louisville. And, uh, and uh, Thomas doesn't find out that until he's been transferred to Cal
California. People have told him that. Who's going to replace you? And he said he can't believe that Schofield's going to replace it. He believes that's something officers don't do. And, and Schofield he finally finds out. Now, Thomas weighs 300 pounds. Now, you really shouldn't get angry when you weigh 300 pounds. Because Thomas feels a pain where you want to see, or you better, if they, since they don't have uh, pacemakers, you're, you're in deep doo-doo. He feels a pain in his chest and collapses, and is probably dead within two, three minutes. So, uh, and granted, when he goes out this time, it's not going to replace uh, Thomas with Schofield. He's going to replace Thomas with, with John Logan. Now, John Logan does not like West Point. John Logan is a politician, probably the most successful of politician generals. So uh, he's planning to run for, he ran for vice president back in, 19, in 1880. So he's planning to run again. So what does he do? He pays to get the Sacrarama painted. And who's the star in the Sacrarama? General Logan. <laughs> So it didn't do him any good, he wasted his money. <laughs> so always, I always remember, don't get too angry. Yes? Is, was Grant with me because he didn't trust me or was, was he there because that was the key point for him to be in the most important place? What was the question? Was, was Grant with me because he didn't trust me or was it no, they're getting used to each other. They're two different personalities. Uh, me and Grant are different personalities. They've got to get used to uh, operating together. Now, after 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 the eight on uh, after the 18th day of April at Petersburg, they cooperate very closely. So it's uh, getting, getting used to uh, uh, me, getting used to the Army, the Potomac, and uh, I, I, I think uh, uh, if, I think right if that had been Sherman, he would have been much more congenial with what's going to happen. But he'd been working with Sherman, he'd been working with Sherman a long time. And he's just getting used to me. And mean staff. And didn't uh, Sherman tell Grant to stay out of Washington, not to go to an office in Washington? Yes, he was. Uh, he, he was hoping that Grant, as general in chief, <coughs> would stay in command of the Department of the Mississippi. That's what Sherman ends up in command of. Uh, so he was hoping that uh, Grant would stay out in Chattanooga. Uh, he was not uh, too happy with his assignment there, but he was a, but he is, uh, he uh, is, knows more about railroads than any other Union general. He, uh, uh, you have, you, he, he knows that uh, he has to have a working logistic uh, base, which is in Nashville. Mansfield base, Chattanooga, and and he has the plans of the Western Atlantic Railroad for all the bridges they built, and he's already ordered timbers of that size. So when they burn the bridge across, when they destroy the bridge across the Etowah, which took weeks to build, his engineers rebuilt it in three days. When Upton makes his attack on the 12th, wasn't part of his success that he led his regiments in column as opposed to forming into line? Uh, yeah, when Upton made his assault, was part of 
the success because he led his men in columns instead of in lines? Yes. The Union really does it too. Uh, if you went into, went into more detail, the Union lines up in column of attack on, on the, the people that are attacking there. Uh, Mott kind of groups up, uh, but the Union troops will be attacking in line. So there won't be much difference between each regiment. In 1861, the Union Army was about 16,000. In 1864, it's a million. What effect did that have on the ability of Sherman and Grant to, have to run their campaigns? The, uh, when the Army increased from 16,000 to a million, uh, what effects did that have on Sherman and Grant on how they had to run their campaigns? Well, it was good. <laughs> they don't have to worry about casualties. And then, to be brutally frank, they can make good the casualties. And they, what they do really, they use the heavy artillery. You you live up in Hartford, Connecticut, and you join the first Connecticut heavy artillery. You're going to spend all the war until until mid May. Going to the slop shoots and going to whorehouses <laughs> and playing cards because they because they're not exposed and they give them no training when they arrive in the army of the Potomac they give them no training when they arrive and they take and that's why the first Massachusetts heavy artillery loses more men than any other regiment because they went into battle with around 800 men and lost over 600. Men at the Battle of Petersburg. Anybody else? So, with, with what you were saying, why are those men not getting trained? Why did they not train the artillery artillery? Well, they train them, they go out and drill, <laughs> they try the cannons, <laughs> but they don't try people shooting at them. And they haven't been exposed to going into battle and line of battle against the Confederates. So they get on the job journey. Now, don't get too harsh on them. During World War II, we had a program. When we were planning to have a 100 division army, by, uh, by the fall, uh, uh, after, the, after the breakthrough, and the Germans fall back to the Siegfried Line, fall back to the Rhine, they don't realize how fast the Germans are going to recover. And so they go to these ASTP guys. They're smart. They go to college. They spent two years in college learning all about it. But they, this is the first time they're going to be exposed to battle. And you, and you go, the first sergeant comes down, tell, tell out one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I want these people in my unit. The poor bastards don't know it. They don't know the first sergeant. They don't know the men that are going into battle with them. And uh, so they lack that familiarity with the veterans. They do not get charged. They're, they have no training uh, in combat. And they go, and they go to, uh, they go there and get thrown into the Herdman Bowl and uh, all hell breaks loose. Because everybody is, by, 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 as you go into November, our war department decides the war is over. We're going to quit drafting. So who do we have? The AP, the APS, the uh, these uh, trained battalions that have been going to school, learning to be officers, and now they're exposing them to uh, the drummer boys who are fighting in defense of their homes. And the and the court and the course and the casualties zoom upward in that period of World War II. There are many. 
leadership, contemporary leadership books that credit General Grant with many wise management decisions. And he wanted to keep Meade as immediate general of the Army of the Potomac with all of those wise management decisions. We would get replaced within our battalion, and they didn't know shit from a tin horn. <laughs> And the first thing you know, the Japanese are shooting at them. <laughs> Mr. Fox, you referred earlier that General Lee, while he didn't make many mistakes, he made a mistake at the mule shoe because he had pulled back yeah. his. Can you address why did he do that? I was glad he did. Why he pulled his artillery out, I don't never know. Indeed. Yeah. And then when he comes back after the attack over on the extreme Union uh, right, as you look on your map, the Union are going to advance. The Confederate artillery there. And they're going to pull, pull uh, and the Union, when they attacked the Confederate defense line on the 12th, they're going to get the head shot out of them. Because the Confederates have all their artillery there, and uh, you can see the uh, Confederates there, and you can see the Union falling back. His granted first strike had moved his men over on the extreme right. And then he moved them back. And Lee had put his men in at the base of the you know, shoe. Rob? Sure. Uh, I'm getting the impression that Spotsylvania is not a smashing victory for the Union. Lee got away with most of his army. Uh, the war is certainly not over. So, why is this good for Lincoln? It helps get him reelected. Well, I want to know why Spotsylvania was good for Lincoln and his election. Well, it's good. it's good for him, but Grant, after after Spotsylvania and Cold Harbor and June 18th, doesn't attack Fort again. He knew that it was not going to be good for Lincoln if they kept doing it. But, but, of course, Sheridan bails him out because he destroys Ernie's command up in the valley. So that's why I think uh, that a lot of people will be angry with me. That's why I think the Battle of the Opecken or Third Winchester is more decisive than the fall of the latter. With, um what would you say are the fundamental difference between combat veterans from World War II like yourself and the veterans of the Army of the Republic? Well, what would you think the basic difference would be between veterans of World War II like yourself and between uh, Army of the Republic? Well, the difference is now, I know about them from the wrong way. I know about the Civil War, and then I learned about World War II. And in World War II, I learned, now, uh, I learned that you, the basic things are the same. Veterans have the advantage in World War II of knowing the terrain, that you want, you don't want to cross an area that is <coughs> in light, light grass or something, or a, a field of potatoes or something, or you're going to uh, see your last. Now, when I was shot, the area was about as level as where I'm sitting here. But it was sod. 
Then about where the rail is, it started dropping off very rapidly. Probably 15 yards on a slope. Then it came to a creek that was shallow and about eight inches deep, and about, again, about 10 yards across. Then it sloped up on the other side. And on the other side, right below the lip, the lip here, the Japanese were in pillboxes. That was our undoing. And the Japanese were pretty good with the machine guns. Because in the squad I was in, I was one of the lucky ones. Five got killed, and three of us got wounded. Now, if I had been shot by an ambush machine gun which fired very rapidly, I wouldn't be sitting here. Because the Nambu fired very rapidly. Ha, 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 ha. So I would have been shot in the left elbow. The next shot would have hit me in the center of the chest, not my right shoulder. So the next one hit me in the right shoulder. So I was shot with what is called a woodpecker. It's a maximum machine gun that fires real slow. Whoop, whoop, whoop. And that second whoop kept me in the shoulder. If it had been an ambu, it would have got me in the center of the chest and I wouldn't be sitting here for the rest of you. And then they, when they knocked me down, they went after me again, but they weren't very lucky the second time. They shot the, the left side, they shot the left side of my heel off and put a nice graze across my butt. And I found out the butt is called the gluteal region of the body. <laughs> We're grateful that the Japanese weren't all that effective. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, yeah, I, it, uh, if I could ask a question, not uh, uh, actually about uh, Spotsylvania, but I was, uh, I was wondering, I, I saw a doc, I was watching a documentary a couple nights ago. I, um, there was a plot to assassinate Jefferson Davis. Uh, well, who, who got that? Uh, who, who got, I didn't see it all. So I, I, when I, I first visited Shiloh, the Battle of Shiloh, in. Uh, May of uh, 19, uh, about 1956. And I run into the park historian, it's Pete Shep. And then Pete says to me, Ed, I see you were in the Marine Corps. I see you were badly wounded. Now, I want you to come for a walk with me. Because all the old Confederates said if John, General Albert Sidney Johnson had not been mortally wounded, they would have won the Battle of Antietam. I uh, mean, the Battle of uh, the Battle of uh, Shiloh. Well, when I walked toward the Union defense line, I walked by the Buddy Pond. Then I go out and plow his field and it's flat as hell. Then I get, that's where Hurlbut's division is camped. Then I come out where you run into Dill's branch. Dill's branch runs at right angles from the way Johnston and I would have been riding. And when you come to uh, Dill branch, it's very steep. And in fact, I had to get on my butt and slide down Dill Branch. And Dill Branch was uh, full of water. Since they put in Barclay Dam, the water would have probably been up to my crotch after they put Barclay Dam in. Then I had to go up the slope, and Grant's chief of artillery has 60 guns in the place. And I said, tell Pete, 
I think if Johnson, uh, I think the Confederates are smoking something they shouldn't smoke. <laughs> they said Johnson would have won the battle of Vietnam and KIA. Ed, what do you know about the efforts to assassinate Jefferson Davis? The Dahlgren, Admiral Dahlgren's son's raid. I think there, 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 are two, there are two or three books written by it. Having a high opinion of General McPherson, I think, uh, I think he pretty well as that it was a planned thing. Maybe not by Warren Lincoln or the Secretary of War, but either by Goldwyn or uh, or his or his, or his command, his regimental commander, because I I don't think they could have uh, got the paper they need uh, to prepare the papers on, which exists. So I think it's a book of BS. Because yeah. they, they came out with two books of, uh, back when that was running. And one person who I have a very high opinion of came up with the opinion, no. It was uh, probably planned uh, by, uh, it was probably planned, but not by, it was probably commanded by Kilpatrick who was a glory boy and a loose cannon. <laughs> Probably not planned by Goldman. It was also somewhat loose. Because <clears throat> Goldman, of course, uh, at the Battle of uh, Hagerstown, had been shot here. So Goldman has only one leg. And the Confederates carried off his leg. The Confederates carried off his leg, his, his prothesis. <laughs> and Davis was very friendly with Admiral Goldwyn. He wrote him a personal letter over. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's give uh, Mr. Boyer a big hand. <laughs>